So, wow, you're 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 on a, you're on a new side there, Michael. Yeah. Different. I don't like different. We don't like different. <laughs> we don't like change. <laughs> don't like change. <laughs> Right. Especially New England. Especially New England. Oh, New Englanders are particularly. We've always done it that way. Oh, okay. The uh, what is it they say about Alaskan Episcopalians? See, Episcopalians are God's chosen, frozen. But in Alaska, they're God's frozen chosen. <laughs> Uh, okay. So, um, how long? God, it seems like it's been forever since uh, I was up here. It's been, I guess it's only been two weeks. So, the Boston Marathon bombings. Did it cause you to ask, at least at some point, why? Why does God let this stuff happen? Did it? I mean, no? That you didn't ask that one? They did it, but you asked why they did it? <clears throat> well, the question is, allowing you to have You've given us free will. Yeah. And so we can't play it again. And, and us, in our weakness. Yeah. <laughs> I suggest to you that the, co the question is far more complicated than that, but um, that's, the tr that's a very traditional answer. What were you going to say? I was going to say it, it raises, as he said, the question of why the people who came here, who educated here, were on assistance here, decided to build that package. I, as an actor, I'm supposed to be able to get through the mind of my character. I don't know that I could do this. <clears throat> well, that, that's uh, the, the question of how can someone come to this country, live in this country for a decade or more, and then end up doing this. Uh, I've, I, you know, I, I've had that same kind of thought. And, but I concluded, you know, not long after 9-11, that I'm never going to understand that worldview. I'm just not. Uh, it's completely, totally, utterly foreign to me. And trying to understand it is futile, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, the question of, of evil, I'm going to shut this door. Anyone who's coming to adult class, we're getting started right now. So the, the question of, of evil, the presence of evil, when we believe in a good and just God, is a question of the ages. And I've got to tell you now, there is no satisfactory answer. There just isn't. There are better and not so good ways of addressing the problem and thinking about the problem. But ultimately, when you're faced with evil yourself, whether it's the everyday variety of sickness and death, or whether it's the unspeakable kind of someone doing something deliberate to maim and injure people, when you're faced with evil, there is no satisfactory answer. The last place to ever start talking about uh, evil and a good and loving God is to a person who's just encountered evil firsthand because there just is no making sense of it. I mean, it, it's, I've, I've read about this subject. People have written volumes. You could probably create a whole library of books devoted to nothing but philosophy and theology subjects uh, having to do with evil. 
And uh, when it all comes down to it, after you've read them all, when you're faced with it yourself, there really are no good answers. So, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to think about it. And so that's what I'm going to try to do. And with no small amount of trepidation on my part, uh, the immensity of the topic, the, the complexity of the topic, and so it's not, I'm, this is going to be a, a multiple lesson. This is not going to be done just today. So what I'm going to do is, uh, a large part of what I'm going to do today is sort of by way of introduction, and then I'm going to lead us through, to say that broad brushstrokes is an over, understatement, a broad brushstrokes of the Old Testament to give a sense of what does that part of the Bible say and tell us about evil and God. But I want to start, and this is by way of introduction, and by the way, I... Uh, a great majority of what I'm um, giving you is from a book called Evil and the Justice of God by N.T. Wright. Not a big book, only yay, yay big. Uh, very accessible, although it can get heady uh, at times. So the first thing uh, I want to deal with is what I'm going to call the myth of progress. Uh, we live in a world that seems to believe and has believed for quite some time that things get better over time with human beings. And uh, I think that's delusional. There is no historical evidence to say that as we advance intellectually and technologically that we are also advancing ethically and morally. Uh, I submit to you that we are not. Uh, that the, the whole myth of that kind of progress, what some call social Darwinism, uh, the evolution into more loving and just beings is not happening. But it's not a new kind of thought, at least since the middle of the 18th century, philosophers like Kant and uh, Hegel, uh, Hegel in particular suggested that uh, more or less that the world was progressing by means of what he called the dialectical process, which is basically this. First you get A, and then you get its opposite B, and then comes a synthesis of the two, and with every uh, A and B, you're moving forward uh, in some way towards a perfect end. That belief in automatic progress uh, was influential in generating the, and sustaining a, the Western belief, Western Europe and the United States. Uh, it generated the belief that the West was on the leading edge of human development. And that justified a lot of the imperial expansion that went on in the 19th century. We are the advanced civilization, so we will go and help these uh, lesser uh, cultures. And so, like I, as I already suggested, this is given an enormous boost by Darwin. So you've got the heady combination of technological advancement and achievement and medical advances, and you've got this Hegelian progressive idealism, and then you've got social Darwinism. All of it created a climate of thought in which, to this day, many people live. And the climate that I'm talking about is found in phrases like, in this day and age, see, in this day and age, certain things are expected. People envision a steady march towards freedom and justice. When people say things like, certain things are unacceptable now that we live in the 21st century, they are appealing to an assumed doctrine of progress. Now, oddly, this notion of, of progress survived. This has been, since it's going on since Hegel, so that's, uh, what, 18th century. So it survived World War I and World War II, this idea of progress. It survived the trench warfares and the Battle of Somme in July 1st through November 18th of 1916. And in World War II, this idea of, of progress survived Auschwitz and Buchenwald. People still continue to suppose that the world is basically good 
and that its problems are solvable with more technology or more education or more money, more cameras. If we just had more cameras, if we had cameras on every corner, we would be able to stop these whoever. Hogwash. And this is a this is a complete this is sort of an, a complete aside. I went uh, almost immediately after the Boston Marathon bombers. I went around on on Google looking for what I call the conspiracy Gnostics. It is a, a secular, strange form of Gnosticism, where people are convinced in conspiracy that it was the government that blew up those people in the Boston, and they're out there. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I, uh, I am in awe, at one level, of the imagination it must take to assume that the US, U.S. government has the omniscience and the omnipotence that it would have to have to pull off some of these conspiracies. That I digress. <laughs> So anyway, this, this myth of progress has led to, uh, and N.T. Wright says, uh, that there are basically three problems. The first is that we tend to ignore evil until it hits us in the face. Uh, the, the relativism in our age, especially the intellectual kind that occupies the ivory tower, challenges the very notion of objective morality. Uh, good and evil are merely points of view, a perspective. <clears throat> Postmodernism says we should celebrate whatever our instincts, whatever instincts we find in ourselves. And I suppose the intellectuals in the ivory tower have the luxury of thinking great thoughts like that and, and ignoring the facts on the ground, as it were, in, on Boylston Street in Boston. The second thing is that then we're surprised when evil hits us in the face. Uh, indeed, terrorism still seems to take us by surprise. We're shocked again and again by the fact of death. Uh, death, which our forebears took for granted, uh, has vanished except uh, in horror movies and war movies. It's been banished from our society as well. Fewer and fewer people even die in their beds anymore. So we're, we're sheltered from death. We don't see it. And the end result, again, this is N.T. Wright, the end result is that we react in mature and dangerous ways. And this is what he means. Namely, we react with either-or thinking. And this type of either-or thinking is true on both sides of whatever fence we want to define. Either or, all or nothing. Either all Arabs are evil or all Americans are evil. Uh, or, to, uh, from the liberal ivory tower, we might get, and I've heard uh, some people suggest, that Americans are so guilty in all respects that therefore uh, protesters and terrorists are justified. It's hard to imagine that people believe that, but they do. The American justice system, uh, my, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting another digression. <laughs> You know I love my parents, right? I love my parents dearly. But my fault, but, <laughs> but, mom and dad don't listen. Uh, my, I was on the phone with my dad and, and he's saying, well, you know, we should, we should amend the Constitution. And we should make it possible for these, these homeland type citizens who do this kind of stuff to be denied their rights and blah, blah, blah. And I, I didn't say anything. But what I thought was, oh boy, what a hole that is. What a huge, terrible hole uh, that is. And talk about unintended consequences. I, I can't even, I don't even want to begin to imagine where that could ultimately lead, if not in our lifetimes, just a couple generations from now. But it's the sort of lashing out, you see. The lashing out at the perceived evil and confident that this, whatever this is, is the solution. 
is an example of the immature thinking that I'm talking about. So the immature reactions to evil, they might be more easily seen when we turn this whole question inward on yourself. So, you know, what are you angry about right now? Who has done something to you that you feel is unfair or unjust? How do you cope with it? How do you come to terms with it? We often react to these kind of things, you see, in one of two ways. We blame others. I'm the innocent victim. It's society's fault. It's the government's fault. You know, claiming victim status is the sort of new multicultural sport uh, today. But the other extreme is we, we blame ourselves, which is, I think, a cause of depression. I think that some people, perhaps even many people, uh, experience depression because of uh, undeserved guilt. I mean, we're all guilty, but to beat ourselves to the point where we end up in depression is overkill, to say the least. And politically, we seem like, you know, in these moments, like after the Boston Marathon or after 9-11, we oscillate between these two, blaming others and blaming ourselves. But uh, those are also uh, inadequate responses to the problem of evil. Postmodernism, I'm going to come back to that word again. Here's the thing about postmodernism. There is heavy irony in the fact that we are living in an age where we want more truth. We want background checks. We want uh, interagency communication. We want record keeping, okay? See, the irony here is that postmodernism, on the other hand, insists that there is no such thing as truth. And that's the irony, is we want background checks, we want interagency communication, we want these people tracked, as if that were some sort of truth that could be tacked down and nailed to a wall or to the post office bulletin board. I happen to think that it can be nailed down, <laughs> but postmodernism says, oh no, there's, there's no truth, there's only points of view. Having said that, postmodernism does begin with an interesting premise that a lot of people today don't begin with, and that is that all humans are deeply flawed. But at that point, it completely avoids coming anywhere near to what we might call a doctrine of sin. Instead, humans are flawed because we're constantly changing. We have no fixed identity, and, and hence there's no responsibility. In postmodernism, you can't escape evil, but you can't find anyone to take the blame either. And we only need to reflect for a moment on how certain tragedies come to light in the courtroom rather than the emergency room to see the point. Something, some certain flaw in a system is known but never repaired or dealt with, and when, you know, it all falls apart and there's a tragic loss of life or terrible injury, the thing is, is that no single company executive or board member can be held responsible. There obviously is a problem, but there's nobody to blame. If there is a silver lining to postmodernism, it is the fact that it does flush the whole notion of progress and says there isn't any such thing. But there are a couple of other problems with postmodernism, and I, I think. First of all, postmodernism is ultimately dehumanizing. If there's no, there's no moral dignity when nobody is left to bear the blame. And many of us, certainly the victims of the Boston Marathon bombing, would find the whole notion of no one to blame counterintuitive, if not disgusting. Human beings, if they truly have dignity, are responsible agents and have to be regarded that way. And the other problem, with the second thing to say about postmodernity post is it allows no, no room for redemption. There's no way out. Postmodernism may be correct that evil is, a re is real, but it gives us no clues to what we should do about it. So we should look elsewhere. So where could we look? Well, a lot of people look in all kinds of places. There are all kinds of worldviews that have uh, said something about evil. 
Uh, the Buddhist, Buddhism says that the present world is an illusion and that the aim of life is to escape it. Uh, that has several affinities with uh, Platonism. Uh, Plato, one of his you know, big points was that this, is all a, that this isn't the real reality. There's an even more real reality somewhere else. Uh, Hinduism says that the evils that afflict people in the present life are explained by the wrongs committed in previous life or lives. Uh, to get away from religion, you got Marxism, uh, which uh, selectively elaborates on some aspects of Hegel that says that the world is moving towards a determined way, that way, of course, being the dictatorship of the riffraff. That's my word for the proletariat. The dictatorship of the riffraff or the unskilled laborers and the problems along the way, namely violent revolution, are simply the growing pains that will be justified by the final result. The glorious end in Marxism justifies the messy means. In Islam, if I understand Islam correctly, says that the world is in a state of wickedness because the message of Allah uh, through Muhammad has not yet spread to all the people. And the solution is for Islam to be brought to the world uh, and that generates a sharp distinction between what I think is fair to say the majority of Muslims who see this as a peaceful process and the small minority who want to achieve it through jihad, or however you pronounce that. And the, the thing that confuses me about this is that if you, if you look at the Muslim countries where presumably the word of Allah has spread to everyone, they're not peaceful. <laughs> So I don't know how, you know, I don't know where this is all coming from or what, how they, uh, they explain the presence of evil even among uh, Muslims. So what would the Christian view look like and how would it differ? And that's the subject I'm going to try to dive into. But first, a few more preliminary points. Uh, the first is to say that if we're going to look at a Christian view of evil, we have to come to terms with, I can only describe as the demonic dimension to human evil. Uh, M. Scott Peck actually uh, addressed this in a very interesting book, it's, been, it's quite old now, called The People of the Lie. Uh, M. Scott Peck was a psychiatrist, and uh, in the standard model of psychiatry, and I don't know exactly what that is, but that's what M. M. Scott Peck says, that in the standard model of psychiatry, there is no such thing as evil. But Peck came to, to regard or realize that there were certain patients, and even certain families of patients, uh, who were suffering from more than simply being muddled or misguided. And he came to the conclusion that it's possible for humans to be taken over by evil to believe a lie so powerfully to forget that it's a lie and to make it the foundation of one's life and very being. These are people who are absolutely convinced and will often argue, argue vehemently and persuasively that they are not only in the right, but they are the ones who are leading the way. In the people of the lie, Peck argues that there is such a thing as a force or forces of evil which are supra-human, I'm not saying super, supra, uh, above and beyond, transcendent, outside of humanness, other than humanness, but looks human or has some relationship with humanism, human, humans, and this force can take over people and even entire societies, according to M. Scott Peck, and I agree with it. So the language of demonic, though, can be fraught with problems. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, to paraphrase him, he said there are two problems with Satan is that you can find him under every rock, and the other is not finding him under any rock. Okay, both of those problems are, are wrong. Those are the wrong, that's the wrong approach. But demonic is, is the only language that can describe what people like M. Scott Peck, and, and certainly I've experienced it myself, it's the only language to describe what you're seeing, what's happening. Uh, Walter Wink, <clears throat> who died last year, 
uh, also a fairly prolific author. Uh, he wrote um, three books, Naming the Powers, Unmasking the Powers, and Engaging the Powers, over a period of time between the 80s and the 90s. And he wrote that there is something to be said for the view that institutions have a soul which is greater than the sum of its parts. And in some cases that these institutions, these companies, governments, or God forbid even churches, can become so corrupted with evil that possession is the only way to explain it. Westboro Baptist Church. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you describe that? I, mean, I honestly, I, how do you, you know, that and, and you know, cults where you've got the David Koresh's, uh, the Jim Jones, to date, to date me. Anyone here remember? <laughs> Okay, no. Uh, go Google Jim Jones. Um, and, and so they're cults. And, and how do you explain one person? You know, I'd like to think that I'm a pretty charismatic guy. <laughs> but, you know, if I handed you a glass of Kool-Aid, <laughs> that's a Jim Jones reference. <clears throat> you know, I don't, think, I don't see you drinking it. Okay. If I told you that this is poison and you need to die, here, drink this, then you're nuts. But there are situations where people and groups of people come, become possessed by something. But the second thing to say before going headlong into the Christian answer is that while on the one hand, yes, there's a demonic element, the other thing that we need to come to terms with is that the line, and this is borrowing from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, the line between good and evil runs through each and every one of us. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he returned to Russia after his long exile, uh, he, he went and greeted everyone in his journey, including local bureaucrats who had been involved in, and tyrannized fellow citizens under communism. And people said to, to you know, Solzhenitsyn, what are you doing? Fraternizing with the enemy. Uh, and, and his response was simply, well, wait a minute. The line between good and evil is ne never simply us and them, as if the line is out here. The line is here. It runs right through each and every one of us. Yes, there is wickedness, and we need to distinguish between small and low-grade versions and the large and terrible versions. The petty thief and bin Laden are not of the same caliber of evil. The Harvard cheater and Hitler are not the same, not exactly alike. But we must not suppose that evil can be addressed by looking at it the other way, by labeling some people good and other people bad. These are good people, these are bad people. Alexander Solzhenitsyn says, no, it runs right through each and every one of us. So, what can God do about evil? What is evil? Why is it here? Why is it here in the first place, or even in the second place? Why is it allowed to continue, and how long will it go on? The Bible asks all of those questions. And annoyingly, frustratingly, none of them receive a full answer. The Psalms frequently ask, How long, O Lord? Psalm 13, verse 1. Psalm 79, verse 5. How long, O oh Lord? One of my favorite Charlie Brown cartoons was the one where, you know, Charlie Brown, Lucy's holding the football, and <laughs> he falls for it one more time, and he goes running to kick the football. Lucy pulls it out from under him, and the last frame is Charlie Brown lying on the ground saying, How long, O oh Lord? <clears throat> There are strange hints in Scripture about wickedness being even allowed to go on so that when God judges, his judgment will be seen as just. There's some uh, 
statements to that effect in the book of Revelation. And uh, my, my Nick and I have been talking a lot about Revelation, well, not lately, but he was doing some study in, in Revelation, and he brought up this subject that, well, you know, it, it says here that, that Satan will be bound up, but then he'll be, he, he'll be allowed to, you know, to be let loose. And uh, I said, yeah, and, and the, the thinking is that he's being allowed to sort of do his thing so that just, just to make sure that when God does finally judge, that everyone will agree that his judgment is just. As far as I'm concerned, I think I've seen enough. I'm ready for the judgment to come. <laughs> um, but again, that's, maybe that's another digression. Uh, there are fleeting glimpses of evil as an intruder into God's good creation, Genesis 3, and the serpent, for example. But the concept is never set out to, at least not to my full satisfaction. And the Old Testament swings between evil as idolatry leading to dehumanization. It's evil is what wicked people do, and evil as the work of Satan. But none of those are explanations of evil as such. The Old Testament has quite a lot to say about what, can, what God can do, what God is doing, and what God will do about evil. Uh, the Old Testament gives us, uh, well, both much less and much more than simply a set of dogmatics and ethics. Uh, it, it's much less and much more than, than simply a progressive revelation where there's a sort of steady unfolding of who God is. I've actually talked about uh, progressive revelation as a way of explaining things like Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac, you know, what father in his right mind uh, would, would do that, and uh, it, at least one explanation could be that in the religious pluralism of his day, uh, human sacrifice was relatively common, and he was still getting to know God. Why wouldn't his God uh, ask, a ask him to sacrifice his child? But ultimately, progressive revelation is not enough of an explanation for some of the things that go on in the Old Testament. The thing is, is that the Old Testament is simply not written to tell us about God in the abstract. It's not there to provide information. It's not there to be sort of the Old Testament inquirer, status, you know, inquiring minds want to know. It's written to tell us the story of God's work in the world. When I was in seminary, I can remember to this day, my Old Testament professor, uh, the very first words out of his mouth were, the Old Testament is the story of the God who acts. And that's what it is. It is a story of God's acts in history with his people. It's written to tell the story of what God has done, is doing, and will do about evil. So let's consider the narrative. And again, in huge, sweeping, broad brush terms. The call of Abraham. Uh, the Old Testament swirls around this calling of Abraham. Uh, and it seems to be intended by God to address problems that lead up to this call. Uh, in Gen starting with Genesis 3, the fall, human rebellion, and expulsion from the garden, uh, and then moving on to Genesis 6 and 7, which is the human wickedness and the flood, and Genesis 11, human arrogance and the Tower of Babel, and then chapter 12, the call of Abraham. Within that story is a sort of second order problem, Israel, the children of Abraham, they are called to be carriers of the promises of God, but turn out to be part of the problem themselves. And that unwinds through a massive narrative from the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the Exodus, to Moses, to David, through the ups and downs of the Israelite monarchy, the division of the kingdom in the north to the kingdom in the south, and finally ending in Israel's exile. 
And within that story is a third level problem, which is it's not only the human race that has rebelled, and it's not just Israel that's part of the problem, but individual human beings on a personal level are sinful, idolatrous, and hard-hearted. And the results of all of that are ever present on every page of the Old Testament. On the one hand, it's true that the the problem of evil appears in the form of wicked pagan nations oppressing God's poor, defenseless people. That is present in the Old Testament. But the larger historical and the prophetic writings, the prophets, remind Israel that the problem goes deeper than us and them. The problem of the individual is presented as a in the Bible is a subset of the larger problem of Israel and humankind and even of creation itself. So let's consider Genesis chapter 3 then, the fall. I'm not going read to read it to you, but don't you want to know, everyone wants to know, what was that damn snake doing there in the first place? <laughs> That's why you know, to simply say, we have free will. Uh, It's a classic traditional Christian answer, but with a little more thought, but it seems to be more complicated. And I think that the Bible says that it's more complicated. It doesn't give us any answers to why it's more complicated, but I think it points to that reality. And so what we get in Genesis 3 is instead of an explanation for evil, we are given a sort of analysis of it where you get the sort of the strong role of deception that in, and the role that it plays in the way uh, sin enters the picture and the way that excuses are so easily come off the tongue. And, and yet, even our excuses don't put off the responsibility that we have for rebelling against God. The narrative of of Genesis 3 tells us that God judges evil. That judgment is the expulsion from the garden and the curses, and yet God blesses his creation. In a a throwaway line in Genesis 3, after they are expelled, expelled from the garden, just as they're sort of on the way out, as it were, God makes them clothing to wear. So the great story that frames the Old Testament begins a sort of triple statement of the problem of evil. Evil and and God's answer. Evil must be judged and judged severely. God has made a beautiful world and evil is a defacing of that world. And from there we can go on and elaborate that humans, instead of worshiping God as the source of their life, give allegiance to themselves instead. And the earth instead of being ruled wisely by God-fearing, image-bearing stewards, instead shares the curse. It is now a land of toil and a land of thorns, and death comes in as executioner. But interestingly, death takes different forms. It takes the form of exile for Adam and Eve. God told them that if you eat the fruit of this tree, on that day you will surely die. Well, they didn't die but they were expelled from the garden. The flood, I think, is, a, is meant to be a form of death. And uh, in, in the Tower of Babel, the confusion and dispersal uh, are, are death as well. So that's, that's the creation, or the, the fall. Let's think about the flood. I think the flood stands as a reminder that God hates evil and what it does to his creation, and interestingly enough, to the, to the answer of, why doesn't God do something about this? Well, he did in the flood. Apparently God can and does sometimes take action to stop evil in its tracks, but even then, he will find a way of working through and out the other side to fulfill his purposes for creation. Interestingly, just like with Genesis 3, there's this close link between people and the earth. The earth is flooded as a part of God's judgment, and there's a sign of rescue. The rescue, of course, comes in the sign of the the olive shoot, delivered by a dove. 
But now, get this. So the story ends, right, in a vineyard and a deeply mixed message. There is new fruitfulness that has arrived as a symbolic in the vineyard. Remember the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So new fruitfulness has arrived and with it new possibilities for evil stalk the earth. God did something about evil, but it didn't solve anything. Can I just ask something? Yeah. The, the problem I have sometimes, is, though, like after Katrina, you know, people will say, well, God would, did something because New Orleans was a evil place. Yeah. I mean, so, um, I mean, what's that? Well, I, I don't. I don't subscribe to that view. Uh, I'm, I'm simply saying that that the flood, I mean, it, it, it definitely is a story of God doing something about evil. Um, but uh, at the risk of of shattering people's images of, of the Old Testament. I don't think that particularly these, those early stories are the kind of stories that can be strictly read historically. They are, they are stories of, of deep, deep theological truths without necessarily being you know, historically true. And for example, um, there are pagan stories of a great flood. Uh, one of those stories is called the Gilgamesh epic. And it's remarkably similar to Noah. Uh, and I think that the people of God got a hold of these kind of stories and retold them in their, uh, with their understanding of who God is. That said, uh, on the one hand, I think that there are, this is the difficulty, there are consequences for sin. I mean, I think that we can do things and end up with con severe consequences. Uh, I mean, it, easy is to say, you've been smoking for 30 years and you got lung cancer, well, one does have something to do with the other. It's not like God punished you because you, you were a smoker. On the other hand, there are uh, stories uh, that I've heard about healing, and of course we just heard a lot of them, but one that I know of that Mark, it doesn't come from Mark Pearson, uh, came from a friend of mine, uh, my mentor in seminary, who went to see a woman, a uh, parishioner in the hospital who had stomach cancer, and he asked her, why do you think this has happened to you? And she said, my husband uh, punched me in the stomach when I was pregnant and I've hated him ever since. And so he started praying uh, over the issues of bitterness and anger and the cancer went away. Is God punishing her because she's angry at something that she should justifiably be angry at? No. No. But in an Old Testament world where you, you, we don't have the, the, the benefit or the luxury of, of all the information that we have today, it seems pretty clear to me how easily you can come to the conclusion that God is punishing. I think what happens is that it's a consequence. How does that work itself out in global things? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it's trite, but I think that sometimes uh, the things that happen to human beings happen because of our arrogance. How arrogant can you be to build a city below sea level and, and not think that that was going to catch up with you someday? On the other hand, you know, more problematic is the tsunami. You know, the earth does what the earth does. And, you know, water is displaced and it's going to do what it does. You know, what do you do? Do you tell people you can't, you can't live on, you know, the edge of the water? The, the answer, in my opinion, is life is risky. 
and everything we do there are risks I mean I can get I can get I can get killed if I you know between here and the car or there on the way home or uh, you know even here in New England we could have an earthquake and this place could just crumble on top of us it's life that's my answer I don't know if that answers your thing I don't know if that's satisfactory people want to be able to I think it's part of the uh, I'm sorry it's it, it, I think it's also part of the immature reactions to evil and injustice is to say we want to lash out and strike back and blame somebody so this happened it must be God and even well-meaning Christians can say that and I think that they're wrong but I don't know, does that help kind of stepped in late on that, but I, from my perspective, you also got to look at, what, from, from the way I see it, is every time something really bad happens, there's always something good that results from that, in, in my opinion. You know, you have, you know, you have the bombing in Boston, what happened, a whole, a whole bunch of people came together and supported each other, and there were people that stepped up and took care of people, and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it may not be of the same magnitude, but I think there's always, there's always a give and take. And, and I, I agree, and actually we're gonna, I'm going to touch on that. There's a story in the Old Testament that's just about that. Uh, and the only thing I would say is that ultimately it's not an explanation for evil. It's certainly a result. It is, it is a aftermath kind of thing that I think is a common experience. Probably everyone in this room recognizes that, yeah, there have been terrible things that have happened to either us or other people, and good came out of it, even if you couldn't see it in the short term. In the long term, you can see good. I mean, I, uh, I think divorce is wrong, and divorce is tragic. And, you know, outside of abuse in a, a marriage, I can find, uh, I can't really define divorce as very defensible. And uh, the la I'm the last person to try to defend it. And I didn't want it. But my life is exponentially better now than it was then. And I can't even imagine. It, it, without that happening, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be the person I am right now. I'm, I'm the person I am because I met Carolyn and uh, because we fell in love and, w and we got married and now we're celebrating our 20th, you know, 20 years uh, this Wednesday. So that is no defense of, of divorce. I'm, I'm not defending it at all. <laughs> On the other hand, praise God. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that sounds crazy, but I, 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 I just I wouldn't be the person that I am. Uh, and, unless, you know, you know, God, you know, we could have done the coulda, shoulda, wouldas, and maybe God would have changed my ex-wife and things would have changed. I don't know. All I know is what happened. Okay, the flood. Um, the, the, the other thing leading up to the call of Abraham was the Tower of Babel. Human arrogance reaches its <clears throat> height. <laughs> By literally by building a tower to, to make a great name and create security and God sort of looks down in a puny tower and says oh yeah and confuses human languages and then Genesis chapter 12 the the call of Abraham and how is the calling of Abraham going to reverse the curse of Babel or even of the flood or the fall is unclear but in the story once again there's this connection between people and land the arrogant people of Babel build a city and a tower, and God calls Abraham to be a nomad, but promises him, eventually, a homeland. The solution, uh, if, if you can call Genesis 12 a solution to the problem of evil, the sol or even of, or just of Babel, uh, it is an eschatological solution. That is, it, it, is a, it is a solution that lies somewhere out there in the future. It's an, it's an ongoing story that begins with Abraham and has deep ambiguities. Abraham's family carries the promise forward uh, into the future, into a world, a world that was, is going to be put to rights that hasn't happened yet. And 
along the way, Abraham's family is going to have its own version of Babel, Ishmael and Isaac. Ultimately, Abraham's family, which is Israel itself, goes into exile where? In Babylon, in Babel itself. And Abraham's not pictured as any saint. Twice he nearly throws away the promises of God by a self-protecting act, lying about Sarah being his sister instead of his wife. And then he and Sarah take matters into their own hands regarding children. And that one sin, holy cow, is why the Boston Marathon bombing happened. You understand? Ishmael is how we get to Arab. Arabs and Islam. Holy mackerel. That's like if ever there was a uh, evidence of the effect of sin is throwing a, a pebble in a pond and the ripples just go out into eternity. How long will the world be punished for Abraham and Sarah's, speaking of punishment, how long are we going to be punished for that sin? It's an extremely complex story. This is the story of Abraham. And somehow, in ways that I can't really explain, I, I, I think that the sacrifice of Isaac has something to do with what Abraham and Sarah did to Hagar and Ishmael. That it, it, it's some, there's something there. The promises of God uh, to them will continue forward, but the promise-bearing people from Abraham onward are going to know that it comes at a huge cost. I'm almost done, so I'm just going to press on. The, the, the story onward from Abraham to the Babylonian exile continues these themes always stocked full of ambiguities. Jacob cheats his way into inheriting from his father Isaac and then himself is cheated through and through by his father-in-law Laban. Jacob's sons sell their younger brother Joseph, well, virtually sells him, sells him into slavery, where as a result he learns something about the humility that he lacked, but also something of God's strange providence, which is one of the answers and one of the few answers the Bible gives us as to the question of what does God do about evil? And this gets to your point. When his brothers come to see Joseph, they come to him in fear after Jacob's death, Joseph says to them, you intended evil against me, but God intended it for good. Somehow God brought something good out of it. But again, annoyingly, God will not simply abolish evil. And the question that screams, at least in my mind, around all these stories is, why not? And I don't think we're ever going to be given an answer, but we're told in no uncertain terms that God will contain evil, God will restrain evil, and on occasion he will even use the malice of people to further his own purposes, like in the case of Joseph's brothers. So that's the, the Old Testament in a nutshell. Next week we'll look at. So he'll contain it until the time of Revelation. Where? Well, he contains it to a point. To a but point. At that, at that point, it's not contained at all, right? Yeah, yeah. If you take Revelation, it's going to be let loose. Uh, at w at one level, though, I think that in, in a sense, the complete letting loose of evil is what we see in the Passion in the Passion narrative, at a deeply theological level. Evil doing its worst and throwing its full fort and waste, full fort and weight at God. So yeah, we'll get to that next week. All right, gotta stop.